Hi, I'm Eric Brynjolfsson. I'm the director of the MIT Center for Digital Business. Today we're going to talk about the big data revolution. And I have with me Tom Davenport, who helped get that revolution started with his seminal article, Competing on Analytics, that he wrote back, it was about six years ago. And he continues to be doing a lot of work in this area and has some, some interesting insights about how big data is changing management and changing the way business runs. Tom, uh, welcome to the program here. Thanks, happy to be here. So let's actually dive right in and start with uh, that seminal article you wrote. Uh, it was seminal, wasn't it? I think so. <laughs> a lot of other people thought so too, it's, and I know it's, it's widely read. Um, and you wrote a book around that topic too. Uh, you called it Competing with Analytics. Now the buzzword is big data. Uh, so, so what's new? Is this, is this just old wine and new bottles of people rebranded something that you've been talking about for years, or, or is there something different today? Well, I confess that I initially thought it was old wine and new bottles, and I was tempted to do a global replace of everything I'd ever written about analytics and substitute big data. You know, <laughs> you can do that with word processors pretty easily. But then I actually did some research on what people were doing in big data, and I um, my skepticism uh, evaporated. I really do think that there's something new going on here and that it's a, a different, uh, you know, related but different set of phenomena in many ways. I don't know what you think about that. Well, absolutely. I mean, what a lot of people talk about are the three V's of, of difference, you know, you know a velocity, variety, and uh, volume, um, the different ways that uh, data is different now than before. And all, in all those dimensions, if you just look at the numbers, you look at it quantitatively, there have been orders of magnitude changes, partly just because Moore's Law is driving so much data. Now, uh, one, one little statistic we dug up was that uh, there's more data crossing the internet every second than there was in the entire internet back in the 1990s. A company like Walmart uh, processes at two and a half exabytes of data every um, every hour, which is just staggering. Yeah, no, and I, those are just the differences in the data itself, but I also found that there are differences in the kinds of people who do this work and in the mm -hmm. relative balance of data management related activities and analytics oriented activities and even in the even in the overall objective. I mean, the, um, one thing that I hadn't really thought of but before I started talking to a lot of companies about this is that um, Traditional analytics supported uh, internal decisions for the yep. most part and used internal data to do it. Big data is much more likely to be external data, but also it's uh, often to create um, more desirable products and processes that benefit customers. Mm -hmm. So uh, LinkedIn, the people you may know yep. and the jobs you may be interested in and the groups you may want to join, those are all things created by data scientists with big data out of out of LinkedIn data, um, and they make it more appealing to join LinkedIn. So um, I think there are a lot of examples of where it's not just supporting an internal decision process, which was true mm -hmm. for analytics. Well, you brought up a lot of interesting things there about the different kinds of people, the, the data scientists and the analysts, uh, internal versus external. But let, let's dive into that last point that you brought in uh, first, um, which is what happened at LinkedIn. Uh, you wrote a really interesting story about the way uh, there was a data scientist there who really made a huge difference in the success of LinkedIn and maybe it wouldn't have grown as rapidly as it did over the past few years. Um, t t tell us what happened. Yeah, well this guy is named Jonathan Goldman and he is a typical data scientist, I guess if there is one. He's a physicist by background and um, went to work at LinkedIn, was hired by Reid Hoffman, the co-founder, which mm -hmm. um, uh, turned out to be useful to him because he started, he was playing around, he was technically a part of the product team, but Reid mm -hmm. Hoffman had said, you know, if you um, run into any problems, I think this capability is really important, you know, let me know. And so he developed this, this um, capability to figure out um, how some people you might know based on your past, uh, it was initially, I think, fairly primitive algorithm based on your past employment and where you went to school and so on, right. and then you could find out what they're doing now. I mean, and this is for the, the LinkedIn user, so if I was a LinkedIn user and I had gone to, to uh, MIT, it might suggest other people who were in my class. In that, that mechanical engineering or something right. like that at right. MIT, yeah. And um, so he tried this out, and the product people initially were not that enthused, and they said, well, we already have a dress book lookup. Why would we need this? Which <laughs> right. is clearly not the same thing. So right. anyway, he went to Reid Hoffman and said, you know, 
I think this is pretty important. What do you think? And he said, oh, I think it could be really cool. Um, if the product people won't let you put it into the you know, production version of LinkedIn, I'll just give you a little ad. You know, Find out what happened to your classmates or your former colleagues. So he just ran a little ad next yeah. to the main LinkedIn product, so, so an yeah. ad on his own site. Yeah, <laughs> fantastically effective, it turned out. And that got people excited about it. And so they put it into the mainstream system. And now, of course, Facebook has it and Twitter right. has it. This is so that, that people you might know box that sometimes pops up. I read, uh, I read in some of your work, actually, I guess it has something like a 30% click-through rate, which is just, which just staggering. I mean, yeah. you know, anyone who knows about click-through rates knows that you know, if you get it in, into a tenth of a percent, you're probably doing well. So this is a whole different order yeah. of magnitude. And I don't know if they care at LinkedIn about the, you know, the total time spent on the site, but uh, if you've ever used this capability, the, the suggestions just keep on coming as you scroll. And so I waste enormous, who's it going to come up with next? You know, gee, I forgot about that person. Oh, do I really know that person? Yeah, I guess I do. It's quite uncanny, I think. Yeah, uh, and so that's a good example of a person with a physics background who was able to go through the numbers, look at the analysis, and create a lot of value on a customer-facing side of the business. Yeah, and I think it's typical in a variety of ways. One, he is a typical data scientist, this mix of sort of hacking and science uh, mm -hmm. backgrounds with a lot of curiosity and, and given a fair amount of autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is, you know, that it's not a terribly, at least initially, I think it's gotten more complex now, it wasn't that complex of an algorithm. And uh -huh. you often find with, with big data, uh, uh, somebody said to me, uh, big data often equals small math, that mm -hmm. um, you spend so much time manipulating the data and, mm -hmm. and structuring it and so on, getting mm -hmm. in the shape where you can do something with it, you don't t tend to have a lot of time and energy left to do really complex statistical well, models. Well, not only you have a lot of time and energy, but I think equally importantly, you don't necessarily have to do a lot of analysis. If you've really structured the data well, often the answer will just pop out, often with uh, with a very high degree of precision. This gets to the, to the distinction you were making earlier about the analyst side of uh, a big data scientist versus the um, computer science or data munging or, side. Yeah, hackers. The hacker side. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I have the same experience in some of the work we've done with our teams at MIT. Uh, we looked at, at Google Trends to look at, at housing market trends. And uh, it was remarkable how once you got the data formatted, which wasn't easy, but once you got it organized, the answers just popped out. You could write the simplest regression model, the simplest statistical model, and outperform these very complicated models that people had been working with when they had much less data. So to some extent, big data sets can be a substitute for a lot of math and analysis. Yeah, no, I think that's true. And uh, another bit of evidence of that is a lot of data scientists and big data people are very enthused about uh, visual um, analytics uh -huh. and um, use a lot of visual display tools and so on. And you know, you can't do a lot of complex statistical models in two visual dimensions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's indicative of the fact that, you know, often just counting the stuff is is enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. If you, if you set it up right, a, a good count of, of group A versus group yeah. B. Yeah. I mean, the classic example is all those online companies that do A-B tests. And if they structure it right, you know, once you're done with the test, you're done. That's the answer. Yeah. You know, A yeah. is better than do B that, is not. Do that thing. Do <laughs> A. Yeah. 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 So it's not a, a whole lot of analysis. But that actually raises another concern people or uh, yeah, worry people have about big data is that maybe um, this is really something that works for those online companies you mentioned, LinkedIn. But what about the rest, the other 90% of the economy, the mainstream companies, the brick and mortar companies? Are, do they have anything to benefit from this revolution? Or is this something that they're going to watch and, and it kind of goes, zips right by them? Well, I think they do, but they're a little slow to figure it out. I mean, I, I am almost of the opi opinion now that every company has the potential to be a big data company. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if you move stuff around in your business, uh, there, it's pretty clear that self-driving cars and mm -hmm. trucks are going to be mm -hmm. with us at some point, and Google has said that's just another big data problem. How, so, so how is that a big data problem? Where, where does the data come from? I mean, so you don't get clickstream data from the cars, so, so yeah. where's the data coming from in these brick and mortar companies? Um, it's coming from all sorts of bizarre places, from sensors put on every you know pallet that they might ship around, right. or like the um, RFID yeah, sensors. Yeah, yeah. Maybe RFID will finally come to fruition <laughs> after many years. Yeah, uh, but even barcode scanning. As yeah, the as yeah. Moving around. Um, I, GE is one of the most aggressive companies, big companies, in mm -hmm. doing things with big data and. You know, every industrial piece of industrial equipment, a locomotive might have. 
50 sources of big data. I talked to one guy who spent mm -hmm. um, several months trying to as he put it, suck data out of a locomotive alternator right. to try to predict when it might break down or best be serviced, these, which saves a huge amount of money. For right, these them. sensors are getting so cheap and so ubiquitous. I mean, it's the Internet of Things kind of story where there's billions or even trillions of sensors that engineers are just putting them all over all the engines and all the other equipment and machinery they make, all the, the pallets, and so you, you get a flood of data that you never saw before. Um, and then, of course, you put it into some kind of a system. The rule of thumb that I've heard is that about five years after somebody installs an ERP system, they start saying, hey, we need business intelligence, we need big data, because they suddenly realize we've got so much information about our processes that we're not analyzing. Yeah, I made that number up, actually. <laughs> no, no I, didn't, I didn't make it up. I heard it from a, an analytics vendor that I uh, do a fair amount of work with, SAS, who um, the head of uh, sales in Asia Pacific said, by country, he can sort of tell five years after the most companies mm -hmm. in the, that country have put in an ERP system, they call and say, hey, weren't we supposed to do something with all this data that, mm -hmm. that got generated out of that? Do you think this is having the kind of payoff that people talk about right now? There's a lot of excitement. People are, are you know, and there's a, you gave the example of the LinkedIn one, and, and I, you know, we all, we can come across dozens of other anecdotes and examples, um, but, but it, does the net of the successes outweigh the failures? You don't expect that we would actually have any real data on that subject, do you? <laughs> no. uh, well, you know, you and I are both interested in um, the payoffs from analytics, and I know mm -hmm. you've done some work in that area. I've done some work in that area. Mm -hmm. um, in the big data area, I think it's still pretty early. A mm -hmm. lot of the companies are startups. It's um, mm -hmm. I have I haven't seen any systematic observation, but I was just the other day compiling on on analytics in general. Yeah. Uh, your work, my work, some other consulting firms that have done some things, and every one of them show a positive correlation of mm -hmm. some sort uh, between being more analytical and being uh, financially successful. So I suspect we'll have that at some point for big data. Yeah, it seems like it's still early days and it's a lot easier to get the anecdotes. The, this, one of the studies that we did with the help of McKinsey and then Lauren Hitt at Wharton and, uh, and Hee Kyung Kim and, and uh, Andrew McAfee here at MIT, uh, was we just actually asked a bunch of companies, uh, a few hundred companies, how data-driven they were, how they went about making decisions. And it was, a, it was about a 20-minute interview, but we got a qualitative sense of whether they're sort of on the data end of the spectrum or more the opinion and judgment end of the spectrum. And then we separately, once we had rated all the firms, we matched them up to another data set on their business performance. And as you were saying, we found a very strong correlation. The, the Six percent more productive? That's was right, it, yeah, yeah, you remember it well, exactly. <laughs> and the, the ones that were in the top third on being data-driven were about six percent more productive, which was a statistically significant difference. Um, so, of course, in any sample like this, you had examples of, of successful companies that weren't data-driven and unsuccessful companies that were, but on average, the, the message was pretty clear. Yeah, and the companies that I worked with in the early days of competing on analytics all tended to be pretty successful companies. I mean, you know, Capital One, there, you know, there's a yep. banking crisis, they might have a couple of bad years, but in general, fantastically successful. Well, they were really a pioneer at, yeah. at driving this thing, and that's a good example of a company that wasn't necessarily a, an internet company, but one that was very, very data intensive, and they did all those tests with the credit cards. And, yeah, uh, yeah. I think people have come out of that company and brought that methodology to lots of other areas of retail. Unfortunately, retailing. also to a number of their competitors. <laughs> uh, it's a pretty widely adopted ap approach now. Sure. Well, that's that's the way capitalism yeah. works, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, what is a data scientist? Yeah, I mean, it's a term that didn't even exist. I think your co-author coined it just a few years ago. Yeah, he co-coined <laughs> the term. Um, I, you know, I think they were basically trying to get HR off their backs, and so they uh -huh. were casting, what do you guys do? And finally they said, oh, we're data scientists. Okay, we'll put that in the system. <laughs> but does it have any content? <laughs> uh, well, it's rapidly losing its content in the sense that everybody I know is saying, oh, yeah, I'm a data scientist. But uh -huh. um, I think initially, at least, it was this combination of ability to solve business problems, of course, and a lot of curiosity. Uh, ability to tell a good story with data, which mm -hmm. is something it had in common, those people have in common mm -hmm. with traditional analysts, right. but also these kind of hacking skills, these data manipulation skills, right. and many times... now you've got these huge data sets. Yeah. It's not like you can just, you know, load them up on your PC and analyze right. it. Using, you know, Hadoop or Pig and Hive, these uh, Python, these scripting languages that people use to uh -huh. manipulate data. Um, and then um, 
some analytical skills. And that it seemed like the most common place you would find that combination were computationally oriented scientists, physicists, um, mm -hmm. uh, systems and computational biologists. They've, they've in the past worked with these very large data sets, whether it's from you know, astrophysics or, yeah. or DNA yeah. sequencing. Yeah, exactly. Um, if it's um, uh, in the network space, so, you know, like a LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, mm -hmm. I think there's some social scientists who have that kind of background. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, there aren't too many people mm -hmm. like that in the world. So I think we're going to ha probably have to move to other types of skills if we're going to be successful. Well, it's the it's the hot thing. Our friend uh, Hal Varian, what, what did he say that the, uh, the sex, what, what was it that he said? They're going to, uh, statisticians, he was saying, are going to be the sexiest job category there is, and now it's data scientists. Right. So. And you buy that, right? Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by sexy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these people, I think, might not meet the traditional, they might not get wolf whistles or anything as they walk down sexy the street. Sexy in the sense that, that Bill Gates was sexy in the uh, yeah, 1980s. Exactly. And, uh, and uh, certainly in demand yeah. uh, was one, very, one uh, definition of sexy. Um, but uh, as I said, there aren't that many of them, right. and they're, they're a little quirky to work with. Right. In some cases, they have pretty high expectations of right. uh, the companies they work with. Many of them think that they're changing the world and you know they're, they're making a big impact, but they well, want to keep doing well, that. Well, the example you gave at, at LinkedIn was that he got to work directly with the founder, uh, co-CEO, and, and that was the kind of uh, influence that they expect to want to have if, they, if, they're, if you want to bring them on board in many cases. Yeah, one, one of the ones I interviewed said, I don't know why anybody wants to work with us because we're a real pain in the ass, <laughs> frankly. He said, yeah. we're constantly telling people how bad their data is mm -hmm. and they and uh, constantly asking for more options and it's just right. pretty demanding group. But the flip side is that more and more people are starting to call themselves data scientists even if they don't have that whole skill yeah. set. And yeah. it's, uh, actually, it's not just the, the, the data scientists, but it's the and the managers who are saying they're data driven when they really aren't. One of the things that, one of my pet peeves is you go into these companies and uh, they're, they're throwing all these numbers around, bar charts and pie charts, but you, you drill down a little bit and you realize that the decision was made way before they looked at any of those numbers. It was made the old fashioned judgment way. Yeah. And then, they, then they sent their minions out to gather the data. So sort of what I'd call pseudo data driven. Well, so maybe we'll have pseudo big data, or pseudo data <laughs> science before too long, but I agree. I mean, I think the uh, the thing that you you really have to have if you're going to be successful with this stuff is a uh, an orientation to the scientific method and to uh -huh. seeking right. out sources of error and trying to find truth. Right. And right. you know, if you're more interested in how do I use data to further my career, that's that's the opposite motivation. No, isn't that nice that, that if we can bring science to, to to management and economics and social sciences areas we've been working in for yeah. many years yeah. and. And our, our colleagues and the hard scientists, you know, never thought of this as being an area that's amenable to it. But it's finally finally getting there, in part because we finally have something we can measure really carefully in a way we couldn't previously. Yeah. We're going to be yeah. on, a, a hopefully, a much faster pace of innovation and discovery because instead of kind of muddling around, you know, without light, we can now, I mean, the analogy I sometimes make is to what happened with the, the scientific revolution, where finally, once they were able to do the experimental method and measure things much more carefully, you just had a rapidly accelerating pace of discovery. Uh, management hasn't been on that curve uh, until perhaps recently. No, I think you're right. And I, I think it will lead to some second order problems. Um, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day at eBay mm -hmm. about um, all the A-B testing right. that they do. And right. it's a really good discipline and, and you can find out sort of what works in website design and so on. But they said, you know, it, it leads to a certain incrementalism that yes. you, if you're just testing A versus B, you, you do the one that comes out better by a little bit and it sort of takes away the creativity and the large scale innovation that you need to really do uh, um, step changes. So they're trying to incorporate that into some of their innovation Yeah, that, that's a very good point. I mean, Neil Sundarasan, the, the chief scientist at eBay and I were talking a bit about this and, and exactly as you're saying, they've got a huge data set and it's very easy to make incremental A-B tests where you have you know, the chopping cart on the left or the right or the color is different. Uh, that's the easiest thing in the world to do. But if you want to make a fundamental strategic change, that's not the kind of thing you can just A-B test your right. entire company right. on. So we still need humans for some some for, things for, here. For some yeah. parts yeah. of it, yeah. So maybe we'll see you know faster improvement on in those incremental things, but the the big leaps, the kind of things I guess Steve Jobs was famous for, and, and others, and, and sort of really fundamentally rethinking 
without listening to customers as much, that isn't something that's been uh, automated or, yeah, or in, yeah, in close exactly. to exactly. What are some of the, the pitfalls that you see, um, what are some of the dangers, the risks that you see with Big Ed? I mean, obviously, there are these huge opportunities. We talked about the, the money that can be made, the potential for innovation. Are the things that managers should be worrying about? It still has to have some uh, business value, some business purpose. I think there's a tendency with big data to say, well, let's just gather a lot of data and surely we'll find something in there. It's got, uh -huh. you know, got to be a pot of gold at the end of that, uh -huh. that rainbow somewhere. But mm -hmm. I still think, you know, while you want a spirit of, of experimentation and, and exploration, mm -hmm. you still need to have some sort of sense of how's this going to move the needle from a business standpoint. Okay. Um, what's my primary target for mm -hmm. my big data and analytical activities? And that, I think, is shared with traditional analytics. So this isn't the kind of thing where you can just sort of turn the uh, decision making over to a group of data scientists and say, OK, come back in two months and tell us what the answer is? I think that would be risky. <laughs> I, you, you know, you might get lucky, but yeah. I think you'd be much more successful if you gave them a little more business direction. Yeah, so it's that combination of having some domain knowledge, some business direction, as well as the ability to, to, to work with the data. Yeah, exactly. At the, the guys at Kaggle I was talking to a bit, and uh, the thing that really sort of surprised me was how often the winners of those contests ended up being from a very different domain, however. So you, may, you know Kaggle, it's this, yeah. it's this you know, marketplace, really, where they have contests to come up with a better uh, uh, way of rating cars for insurance or, or, or other categories, a customer will give them the data and then they'll open it up to data scientists from all over the world from lots of different disciplines and sometimes in the course of 30 or 60 days come up with a much better solution to yeah. the science problem. I didn't really realize that they were doing these kind of private mm -hmm. uh, competitions and that mm -hmm. they were increasingly viewing this as a way to get you know data science capabilities for uh, for an organization yeah. but yeah I mean I think at the time they told me that their one of their leading data scientists was an actuary which mm -hmm. uh, no offense to actuaries but I was surprised the I sexy profession of the next decade <laughs> right <laughs> uh, it, typically I think of them as being good at you know calculating insurance life tables but right. not doing really creative problem solving. So, you know, yeah. maybe I was wrong about them all, all these years. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think people can come in from outside of a problem area and often see mm -hmm. some, some new some things. Some fresh perspective. Yeah. People have picked over the old methods and sometimes there's some whole new approach. Um, and that's why it's nice to have this community. And that's one of the nice things that the internet and the web world can do is, is bring together people from multiple continents to work on a problem like that. Another set of risks that, that I, I'm, I'm increasingly concerned about, I don't know if you agree, is around uh, privacy and security. When you get these very large data sets, it starts the potential to be, you know, A, very intrusive about people's personal lives, and B, if, if there's health or uh, financial information that's being passed around, um, that also presents a, a serious security risk. I worried about this for a while, and then I came to believe that there is no way that um, our legislators are going to keep up with the capabilities of the technologists to, yeah. to um, learn from the data. So um, in a way, I am a little bit despairing of, you know, as you know, if you have enough data, you can, no matter how much you anonymize it, you can pretty much figure out who the, who the individual is. Right, there have been these, yeah. these classic examples where a company like AOL will turn over a quote-unquote anonymized data set to a group of, uh, of computer scientists and data scientists, and you know, sh shortly thereafter, they'll reverse engineer it and figure out who all the individuals yeah. are in it. Yeah, and Netflix canceled the second version of the Netflix prize for that right. very reason. So um, I just, you know, I'm... <laughs> While I am worried about it, I'm increasingly coming to the point of view of Scott McNeely when he was CEO of Sun Microsystems yeah. who said, you don't have any privacy, Just get over up. it. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's not that it's not a problem, but it's that you don't see a solution, so why bother? Well, I, I don't. You know, I'm hoping there's some smart people at MIT who are working on one, but I... There are people. I mean, Sandy Pentland has got a little project where he's trying to come up with a, a, a data ownership uh, system, you know, but, but I, I, I'm with you. I, it, at this point, I don't see a solution that emerging very clearly. What about the security side? That's that's another one that I think uh, companies, they're worried about, but my sense is they're not worried enough. I think that's probably true, and, and you know, you have to be a little nervous if 
if we're encouraging this new profession that's kind of half hacker, <laughs> and they're going to get a lot of access to databases, and they don't necessarily all feel a lot of loyalty to your particular business, I think I would be quite nervous about the security <laughs> but they themselves, and privacy yeah. implications. Yeah, and then there's a whole bunch of black hat hackers who yeah. are out there trying to, to break in. And you know, after spending a little time with the security folks and, and them showing us all the, the flaws in most systems out there, I just came away thinking, it's inevitable. There's there's going to be a huge data breach, a huge security crisis, even bigger than the ones we've seen. And and I don't see any uh, any way of people taking it seriously until after that crisis, rather than before. Yeah. So are you advising that we take our money out of banks and put it in our master mattresses? <laughs> or uh... I don't know. I don't know. I, I actually, you know, I, I am Maybe I am a little bit worried idea. about it. I'm yeah. just hoping that yeah we'll have some kind of a response that that, that recovers. But. I, uh, yeah, our financial systems are not nearly as secure as they should be, and as more and more things get data intensive, the, the potential just opens up more and more. Yeah, I guess that would, that would argue for, you know, we used to argue for diversification of assets in, the, mm -hmm. in a financial um, management sense for, mm -hmm. because, you know, assets moved uh, up and down at different rates and so on. Now it turns out the assets are no longer a reason for spreading your money around, but maybe the security issue well, would be. That's interesting. That, that gets to, to Sandy Pentland's analogy where he treats information as an asset and is trying to apply some of the things we've thought about for financial assets to information and privacy. And diversification does come to, hmm. does come to mind as one of the things maybe we should be thinking about. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a very new world that was going to require a new set of thinking. I want to get some advice from you. You're perhaps the, the leading thinker in this area and certainly the person that people are turning to for advice. What should managers be doing you know, going forward, either in the short term or the, or the medium term, um, if they want to be successful using big data? I, I wouldn't necessarily advise that you jump in uh, head first uh, if you're you know, a typical industrial or financial company, but I think you really start, you need to be experimenting. You need mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. um, be thinking about what data assets do you have already, mm -hmm. what external assets might be relevant to your mm -hmm. business. Um, uh, if you don't feel like you can compete in the mm -hmm. very tough market for hiring data scientists, you can uh, hire consultants to work with you a little bit or, you know, do a Kaggle competition or something along those lines to just, you know, get a, a foot, more than a toe maybe, into the water and say, uh, this is probably going to be key to our future capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do now to kind of give us a head start in this regard? And be very careful if somebody else in your industry or in an adjacent industry is moving a lot faster than you are. I was talking to some R&D person in one of the big automobile companies, and I said, are you, what are you thinking about this self-driving car? Mm -hmm. And he said, well, we're going to let Google do the experimentation okay. there. It seemed like a really bad idea to me, frankly. That Yeah, I mean, they've already made quite a bit of progress, and, and I was out there. I got to, I got to ride in the Google oh, wow, self-driving car, which is yeah. kind of fun, cruising down Route 101, and uh, I won't tell you the you logo. to tell the tale. I live to tell the tale. Actually, Afterwards, when I came back to Boston and took the taxi ride from Logan, <laughs> you and, were more scared. I, than I, that, I did. Uh, That's exactly. Yeah. I, exactly. I was like, boy, I wish this were a Google car. I would have been uh, feeling a lot safer than the than the taxi driver I got I got from the pool. But um, yeah, I won't tell you the logo on the Google car that I drove around. But there's obviously some major manufacturers that already are working with them. And, uh, and that's a good example of, of companies that are racing ahead with certain technologies that are uh, happening a lot faster than I anticipated just even a few years ago. Yeah, if you, if you compete with GE, and there are a lot of companies that compete with GE, mm -hmm. you know, you'd be aware they're talking about spending a couple of billion dollars on software and big data. So <laughs> you might want to think carefully <laughs> about not doing anything. Not a lot of companies will have a couple billion dollars they can spend, but I guess if they can pick off a vertical area yeah, that they can exactly. go after. Yeah, and then, and, and of course, there are courses and programs. So Sandy Pentland and I are teaching a course at MIT uh, on big data. It's a two-day executive course, and, and we've been overwhelmed by the demand for that course. It's, uh, according to the exec ed program, the most popular course that they've had so far in terms of the waiting list. Um, other advice going forward that people should be uh, thinking about as they move into this area? Well, I think the, the issues that we raised before start thinking much more carefully about about privacy and security issues because yes. uh -huh. you could 
you could get into some very embarrassing situations uh, that affect your customers in a negative way. Right. And, you know, start factoring this into your strategic planning a little right. bit. How does it relate to your future products and, and service right. offerings? Can, you know, how could, we, how could big data make them more attractive to your yeah. customers? A lot of people think that, you know, they think first of the technology, these exotic technologies like Hadoop and the very large data centers that putting stuff in the cloud with Cloudera or, or Amazon's EC2. Um, is that the, the thing that they should be focusing on right now or is that something uh, not, not, about? not the business people, I would say, uh -huh. because I mean, there, there will be, I think, rapid progress in that area as well. Hadoop, despite all the enthusiasm, mm -hmm. uh, I gather, I'm not a technologist, it does some things pretty well, but yeah. there will be a lot of other tools that come along uh, mm -hmm. over the next several years. And that, you know, that problem will be much easier to solve than the creativity about how does it fit your business model and how does it change right. your organization and how do you find the people. You know, right now I think the big constraining factor is the people who can do this stuff. The data is everywhere, a lot of the software is open source, the, the people are not yeah. open source at all. That's exactly what we're seeing when we, we talk to companies as well. I mean, one of the great things is how remarkably cheap much of this technology is. Either it's open source or you do things in the cloud, you can, you can ramp them up a la carte as you need more or less. Um, and so that part has become far easier than you might have been expected. As usual in these kinds of management revolutions, it's the cultural change, it's the leadership issues that end up being a lot harder. The mentality uh, that most managers have, they've been brought up with that, hey, I've got to project a sense of, of confidence that, hey, I know the answer even when I don't really. Um, and that's exactly the wrong kind of mindset for a data-driven world where you have to project the even greater level of confidence that, hey, I don't know the answer and I'm willing to turn to the data and I'm willing to admit to my colleagues, to my subordinates, that um, I'm not coming here with all the answers, but we have a methodology for getting the data to speak and asking the right questions rather than blustering ahead with what we, what we thought was the right answer. Yeah, and really important, I think, to admit when you're wrong and <laughs> to become sort of, as an organization, students of the errors that you make. It's worked out very well in the um, healthcare organizations that have started admitting that they mm -hmm. they make errors, they mm -hmm. get sued less, they improve yeah. faster. I this think that's evidence-based uh, decision making in, in medicine has been a real revolution, and the openness that hospitals now have to say, "Hey, let's go back and figure out which cases went well and which ones didn't go well, and learn from that rather than trying to paper over it." So Tom, with all these companies trying different things, how does a company know if they're doing it right? Well, I think there are some traditional criteria. You know, we don't want to get into the situation we did in the, in the dot-com boom where uh, people say, well, you know, we don't need to make money. We have eyeballs, you know. Um, <laughs> so we got uh, bits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think it's, um, are you actually coming out with a useful product feature or, or at uh -huh. least a demo that, that mm -hmm. might have promise? Um, are you getting more customers as a result of this? Are you making better decisions? I mean, if I'm a VC funding a company like this, it's the same criteria. What's the business model that's actually going to make money? Because right. I think there, that we we might easily get overly enamored of the idea of big data and forget about those traditional sure. criteria. I mean, it's so easy. We have so much data. You can go and you can muck around. And you can find all sorts of correlations and things that are related to each other. That's where the business manager really has to come in and say, look, the goal is to move the dial over here on this performance metric. That's what we're about. We're not about finding other interesting, intellectually curious uh, correlations. And so by asking the right questions and by pointing people towards some kind of measurable performance metric, then you can, you can make progress towards that. And I, I, it's been remarkable to me how successful a lot of data scientists have been once you point them in that direction to move that dial often a lot more than I would have anticipated. Yeah, and they want to make a difference to the business. Uh, as DJ Patil says, we want to be on the bridge, you know, advising the captain uh -huh. uh, on what way to go from a business perspective as well as a, you know, data science perspective. Yeah, what was the, the line you used in, in your recent article about that the consultants are the dead zone? or Being a consultant is the dead zone because all they do is, you know, produce a report or a PowerPoint presentation. Uh -huh. That's not enough. We want to... Right. You know, have a real data scientist, the kind of data says you want to hire is the one who wants to change the world, make a difference to the to the business. But nonetheless, there's there's a power shift going on, isn't there, in the, in these businesses? A change in terms of where the knowledge and ultimately where the authority for decision making resides? Well, I think there is. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting when I was 
talking to these data scientists, um, I, one question I had for them is, how do you relate to the um, to the CIO of yeah. your organization? And a lot of them weren't sure what I even meant by that <laughs> term. Uh, they well, said, oh, you mean those people who run the general ledger uh, system or whatever, but um, they said, you know, we're, we report to the head of product or the CEO or... So they surely go around the whole information systems organization. Yeah, it's very interesting. And I think the, the CIOs of the world are going to have to work hard to catch up and get any responsibility yeah. for this type of thing because they're viewed in many cases more as an obstacle to supplying data than a facilitator of the well, process. It gets to what we were talking about before that a lot of these technologies are actually open source, lightweight things. If you got a, a product marketing manager, they may be able to, to pull together some of these cloud-based, Hadoop-based solutions without going through the traditional information systems organization. Yeah, and you know the worst possible situation for them would be if in a couple of years, uh, the data scientists had moved on to new things, and they said, here, you take this thing and <laughs> try to make it a production. Yeah, throw it over production. the wall. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's all messy spaghetti code. Exactly, code-y. nobody wants that. Yeah, yeah, no, we've all seen that happen a lot of times. But also, with, so that's just in the technical side, but also on the, on the management side, I mean, I'm seeing a transformation. There's this uh, uh, funny term that, that we, you, I'm sure you've heard, uh, hippos, the highest paid person's opinion. And I think that captures very well the way a lot of decisions have been made traditionally. Um, be the, before the big data area, before the analytics era, um, people relied on their gut, their instincts, and when an important decision was made, they'd get around a table and everyone would throw in their opinions, and when they were done, they would go with the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. Now that highest paid person's opinion has a real serious rival, namely data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now I see that a lot at EMC, which is a company that's, you know, in our in our backyard in, right. in the Boston suburbs and historically a very hierarchical company even though it's a data storage company, uh -huh. one driven by power and politics and ego and yep. so on. And now you can start to tell the people who are really prospering, this guy Dave Goulden, who's the name the new president, he was mm -hmm. always the numbers guy, the one who brought yep. lots of data with him to meetings. They're having a course for all senior managers on how to understand and interpret data. So definitely things are changing in organizations and you can't get by with a gut anymore. Well, it's a culture shock. And one of the reasons that these online companies have been doing it so much more rapidly is because they didn't have an old organization that they had to change. They were born digital. But it's good to know there are companies, you mentioned EMC, um, our friend Gary Loveman at Caesars has done a tremendous job changing the culture there. He says he had to change a lot of the management, half the management yeah, over time yeah. to, to make that happen. But he put in place a culture which was you know, not what do you think, but what do you know? Bring me the data. Show me the evidence. For right. Your, your, well, we describe him course. as a Harvard guy or an MIT guy. He taught at Harvard, but I guess he was he trained, was trained at, at MIT. MIT. Yeah, then exactly. He, he spent <laughs> a little stint over there at Harvard, but ultimately, I, I, he was actually a, a classmate of mine in the, uh, in the when he, we were both in the PhD program. Oh, here. funny. Yeah, he has he has been a good role model, and I think they should take more academics and make them CEOs of big companies. <laughs> don't you think? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, you and I know that Gary's unique, and, and we know. Enough academics that <laughs> nine times out of ten, that's not going to work. Uh, well, Tom, it's been a delight uh, talking about these issues with you. It's really fun to be here at the cusp of a, of a revolution and watching it unfold, but also helping to make it unfold. Uh, so thanks very much for sharing some of your thoughts with us today and joining us here with the Sloan Management Review audience. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.